Friends, hello everyone. So, our traditional news webinar on the next generation of airships. Today we have news. Today we will share with you information about how we will launch the first stratospheric device from Nova, but we will also talk about other news. In the studio today, I am Pavel Filipov. Fedor Konstantinov, you have seen us multiple times already, but you have also seen Denis Filipov. Yes, two Filipovs in one webinar. This is a first for us. Denis is currently an employee of Nova, a radio engineer, and a man of the institution, as stated in the description. In general, today we will get to know him better, why he is here today, and what his connection is, in particular, to the transfer device. Before we begin, don't forget to like and share. Your activity greatly helps the project grow, and the more of us there are, the faster the project will launch its own aircraft. Fedor, let's start with the news. What has happened in the company over the past week? And then we will move on to the main topic. Yes, friends, I certainly greet you all. I would like Pavel to start not with the news, but with an old debt. We launched a competition for ideas. I would like to announce the winners. The details are closed, so to speak. We announced the competition regarding an idea. It was some non-trivial idea for the application of airships and similar technologies. Something new, so to speak. Traditionally, because on the internet everyone says, well, airships are for tourism, airships are for transporting people, airships are for transporting large, non-bulky cargo, but what else can be done? And so I periodically know constantly talk about the same idea during webinars. It is a flying medical center. This is Alexander Lobov. Someone suggested this idea to me in a private message on Vicontacte even before they announced this competition. In general, Alexander Lobov is not the only one on this list, but he definitely wins because it is a wonderful idea. As he indeed told the whole story, what is at the present time being done are mobile medical laboratories and medical centers. Well, they don't create centers on buses. They are planning to make a medical train now. But still, a whole flying clinic could be created with airships, which could move to remote cities and villages and provide quality services to the population. This is just a wonderful idea, Alexander. Thank you very much for it. It really expanded our thinking, but let's move on. So, there is an idea for a flying agricultural multi-center for the development of agricultural land that is remote from settlements and roads. Right now, I will actually open this thing here. I can't even read my own handwriting. Sorry. While Fedor is looking for information, I remind you, friends, that you can write your questions, as we have three people on air today. You can specify right away to whom you are addressing your question. Perhaps there is something you want to ask Dennis about. Maybe specifically on the topic he is working on. He will also talk about this in more detail, so don't forget about the questions. We will definitely get to them. So, here is the second winner of this competition, Andrei Bulashov. I certainly couldn't read his letter. Yes, I will elaborate just a little bit on the idea. In general, we have a lot of land in our country, and there is the land that is agricultural and developed. There are roads, there are nearby settlements, there are cities, villages, it doesn't matter. And these are one type of lands. There are other remote lands where there are no roads, no one lives nearby, and they are incredibly good quality for agricultural activities. But it is simply impossible to get there. And so indeed, as an idea, it is a kind of airship that carries all the necessary infrastructure. There are also some advanced autonomous unmanned combines and drones that will efficiently fly around water and effectively monitor everything. In general, it is a whole center that arrives bringing along all the necessary infrastructure to, for example, sow this field, somehow monitor it, cultivate it and so on like a flying mini factory, like a mini plant that carries everything with it. It starts with a combine and ends with the seeds that it sows, and so on and so forth. And some other automatic mechanization system, harvesting, brought containers. It has all been removed. Other states took it away. 
that is, it is a large infrastructural and agricultural solution. It also expands boundaries. The awareness in the field of airship construction is great, so thank you very much, Andrei Bulashov. The idea is awesome. Andre also proposed an idea I had myself, but it's good I'm not the only one who had it. It's in my head. In fact, there have been many discussions and articles in youth technology magazines about what has been done. These are aerostatic supports. For suspended roads, bridges, rope parks, and so on. To stretch a road across a gorge, for example, certain supports are needed, and it is preferable to place one in the middle. You can lean on something. It is possible to not lean on the ground. Roughly speaking, by using aerostatic unloading for this bridge, it turns out that there is no need to build a support. A bridge is like a single entity, while, for example, an entire park could be unloaded with airships. As an idea, it is fundamentally good. I like it, so to speak. Not so much for its novelty, but if we create such a rope park, People will look at it and understand that an airship is not just something that flies somewhere with people, but can also be used in this way. So the idea is absolutely great indeed. And here is the third winner in this competition. I'm sorry, please. I only know the nickname 1AA1, but the idea here is truly impressive in its scale. I will read it exactly as it is in the original. With the aim of increasing the chances of survival from a global nuclear war and supervolcano eruptions, to create an arc at a height above the ash. This city of the sun will be a permanently functioning inhabited station with the ability for autonomous production of plant food in vertical hydroponic farms. To initiate the movement of the arc in neutral waters with permanent residents, along with autonomy, resources and neutral waters, is the basis for submitting a request to the UN about the emergence of a new state. And there have already been such candidates. All investors have a place in the ARC and citizenship. Everyone else can rent a space. To implement this plan, it is necessary to work on the possibility of building a flying office as a prototype of an ARC while designing the working prototypes of the yachts and to assess the new architecture in relation to wind loads, capsizing, and so on. So, one little yacht, a flying office, house, infrastructure, and ARC. What will come next? Invite me to the office, and then I will tell you. And please leave the forest alone. If there is a nuclear explosion, what will happen to the forest? Moreover, if there is a nuclear winter, whether from a volcanic eruption, nuclear war, or something else, the forest there will not survive either. So let's discuss the forest further, but overall, briefly about the scale of the idea. Such a scale is really cool. We need more ideas like these. So this is our third winner, and with this competition we say, Hooray! It's finished. We are waiting for all three in the office. Write to us on Telegram. By the way, Alexander Lobov actually even commented on Vicontacte. He is watching us. That's it. A special thank you to Alexander Lobov. He periodically writes me very sound ideas. I read them, pay attention, and listen. And by the way, regarding Lobov, that's all about the competition. We had Andre Lobov conducting his own competition. This is our local Andre, and there was merchandise as prizes. We inform you that the merchandise is ready. Such stylish merch. Only white, but I think there were also blue ones, right? I only opened the box with the white items, but know that, in general, Lobov will also soon summarize the results, and this sweater, these sweaters, will go to their rightful recipients. Something like that. It's like a field of wonders for us today. So, the first three are coming to the office, right? That means they will write it down, arrive, and that's great. Yes, by the way, we will be sharing news in the office now. Finally, the office is coming to life. Now, Fedor, before you continue, I just see one comment here. Someone is writing to speak louder. Colleagues, please check the sound. Is everything loud enough? And viewers, please let us know if you can hear us well, if it's not too quiet, or if someone is specifically hard to hear. Well, I am usually heard quietly. Please make me a bit more noticeable. Yes, well, about the news, yes, then go ahead. 
So there are some additional and important news. The work on the device is progressing. We are currently working on materials with the Russian company IT Resource and we also have several foreign companies that are part of Solar Group. We are already sending out requests. Two types of requests are sent out regarding the materials. The first is about the purchase of finished material. In general, we reviewed the entire market, what materials are available, all these companies are listed, and contacts have been obtained. Generally, we are sending out letters to find out what is happening in the market, gathering fabric characteristics, costs, conditional delivery times, and so on. This is one of the requests. Material for the envelope of the soft airship. The second type of request is to manufacture our fabric according to our technical specification and we distribute it both in Russia and abroad, including to China, such as in various regions. And the third type of request is to jointly manufacture a new fabric, along with another technical specification. Overall, materials work continues, responsible individuals chosen, and technical specs for the first soft device are written. Work on the engines is also being carried out in a similar direction. Ruslan has a number of engines ready for installation on the airship. They are already available to us. So the first one will definitely fly, and it's clear what it will fly on. But discussions are also underway for serial production. Currently, there is one manufacturer in Russia that will be ready to supply this engine in series. At the same time, Ruslan will likely be setting up a series, but more on that a little later. Perhaps at the conference, by the way, we will share information because there will be clarity at the conference. Something groundbreaking about the engines. We are also reaching out to foreign entities. China has engines. We have contacted them and are in communication. And Europe has two types of engines that suit us. We are also having discussions about them. The external appearance of the device has been determined. The external appearance is conditionally its shape, and there are names for the shapes. Ours will be called Percival, more precisely the shape is called that, and these shapes have a parameter called elongation, which is the ratio of length to diameter. Our extension will be approximately 4.5, so we already have the aerodynamic shape of our device. The calculators have already computed the main loads on the device, the drag forces at different speeds, altitudes, and so on. In general, it was only based on this that the technical specification was later formed. Regarding the materials, what materials are needed, and right now this work is in progress. Based on this, a technical specification will be formed for the engines, their power, and the propellers. The selection of this equipment and those who will do it is currently in progress. There are two, three. Currently, based on, roughly speaking, the engines, the shell, and the tail fins, the control logic of the device is being formed. The control logic of the device is being developed in two directions. The first thing is when the pilot version will be available. There are many different aspects to it. This is roughly speaking about the neural helmet. We are currently living in the 21st century. The pilot can wear a neural helmet and simply control the device. But this is completely risky. Of course, we will experiment. Colleagues, while Fedor is talking about this, please play the video of the scheme that Fedor is discussing. Just today I was walking through the office and saw Milat, one of the specialists who works on this, drawing something interesting on the board. We even filmed a micro interview with him which we will post a bit later. For now, let's show something else. If the scheme is shown now, it will be a slightly different scheme. The logic of controlling the devices is one thing, but the system for managing the entire airship mm -hmm. is a more complex matter. And this is one of the coolest pieces of news that we have formed a dedicated team over the past week. Of the three geniuses, they are Dimitri, Ilya and Milat. And what you see there now? Yes, this is Milat together with the guys forming a general control scheme. These control schemes are developed by entire institutes. Conditionally, and they exist. You can take ready-made ones, but they are still never truly ready. The device has its own control mechanism. Engine propellers. The propellers will have a transmission rotation. The transmission is also being developed entirely by us. 
there are propellers, there are thrust engines, there are rudders, and there are air balloons that compress this helium. There are physical factors influencing the position of the airship in space. Next, control systems should be introduced. That is, what exactly is specifically controlling this steering wheel, through which controller? This is a comprehensive electrical system, a pneumatic system, a hydraulic system. And all of this should come together and be coordinated by unified minds. And this control system is somewhat ready, but there are no complete solutions because such a device does not exist. There are semi-ready solutions that, roughly speaking, are being worked on by large Russian companies. It's expensive and a bit outdated. I apologize for that. We will be creating our own system. Firstly, it will be much cheaper for us. Secondly, it will be super modern. I mean, right down to a neuro helmet that we will be able to connect. And thirdly, developing an independent control system for the airship is more than half of the airship itself. So it turns out, yes. So, colleagues, please show the diagram again as the video ends too quickly. But it's not necessary to watch it there. Well, a couple of times, so that someone might find it interesting to consider. Yes, they could consider it. Well, Milat is currently writing about the first level, second level, third level, and the control system. In the end, all of this will be broken down into specific sensors, engines, and other components, including servo motors. And this control system is one of the most valuable in this airship because inflating a balloon with lifting gas, attaching a propeller, and some engine to turn it all was done 130 years ago. And so, the modern airship is, after all, an automatic station. It is a computer. It is a robot that, with the help of its brains, achieves unprecedented characteristics in control, especially in how it manages itself with the wind. Comfort and safety. So, the work on the control system has started. So, that's really quite interesting and exciting. This is actually the most significant and important news that we've had in quite some time, possibly even months. The control logic for the device is being developed. There will be two options. One is completely unmanned. That's a whole different story. When the pilot Sergei Viktorovich unexpectedly arrived... Hello. The control logic of the aircraft is being developed. The second aspect is that pedals may be introduced for the pilot, similar to those in a helicopter, along with a thrust control system, a lever, and the ability to manage course, pitch, and so on. And these combinations can be completely different in a variety of ways, and can result in outcomes that are entirely and utterly different. We will choose the one that will be on our optionally piloted airship. It has already been almost selected from the scheme, and since it is almost chosen, we already know what it will ultimately be. We have also started assembling the simulator for practicing automatic docking, loading, unloading, and so on. So a simulator will soon appear in the office. And I think the three guys who win the idea competition when they come here will even be able to fly on a virtual airship. So regarding the office, there's news. Well, the office is being furnished. You see, we are no longer hanging out in empty walls. Some of the furniture has arrived and the second part has already been paid for and is on its way. Everything will be completely ready by next week. We have set up a local server here, with storage and computers combined into one local network. We installed several powerful workstations, mainly for the engine specialists who are currently working on it. Soon, when the design phase begins, specifically the preliminary design, the construction of the airship structures will start, including the gondolas, transmissions and so on. Everything will indeed need to be calculated, observed and modeled under various loads. The workstations are generally already prepared for this. Yes, computing centers. And regarding the office, the guys from Tiflex are definitely coming on Friday. If anyone knows, it's our well-known post-Soviet company that is something like AutoCAD. But it has long since outgrown AutoCAD in the industry. They will absolutely tell us, but we don't need to be told. In fact, I understand everything perfectly. Indeed. In general, a unified system is needed for document management. 
starting from conditional memos to design documentation. All of this should be in a single system. Tyflex has such a system. The guys will come, conduct a presentation, and take a look. How everything is arranged here in great detail, and I hope that we will work in their environment. There is an enterprise management system there. If anyone is interested, leave a couple of likes and I'll share it. All the capabilities of Tiflex actually proud. It's really cool that we have this because various companies like Siemens, Enix and others have left the country due to sanctions. And it's good that we have our own IT products. So tomorrow we will have a big important meeting here about specifically which environment to work in. The environment has already clearly been defined. In fact, we will simply be ordering training for certain employees who are still not familiar with it. We have also <coughs> established a high-tech laboratory with state-of-the-art equipment and cutting-edge facilities. This is exactly the information we shared about it. We initially created intrigue among people and asked what it was. By the way, there were those who responded. People are closely following the project. It seems to be Maria Zuza, yes. Not just one person, someone else too. You answered right. Dennis, maybe you could share a few words about what is currently in the laboratory. Yes. We are going to test the communication system for the stratospheric probe in the laboratory right now. That is, one system is already ready, and I am currently in the process of assembling the second system. We will conduct comprehensive and thorough tests on both systems, and whichever shows better performance, we will ultimately use it in the end after extensive evaluation. That is, for communication between the Earth's stratosphere, and it can be used between two probes, that is to say, stratospheres, for example. It is also entirely possible to build a whole point of communication systems, i.e. launch many stratospheres and combine them into one system, well, instead of a satellite. In general, it's not about which one is better. There are two different systems. One is low-powered, the other is high-powered. Both should work simply. One for certain tasks, the other for different tasks. Well, since we have come to stratospheric vehicles... Yes, I will just share a bit of news about what is happening in general. Well, let's go. We have launched this whole story in the stratosphere. What Dennis is currently doing in the laboratory are preliminary experiments. They will be conducted on regular latex balloons. That is, to launch something into the stratosphere, it is necessary to fill it with gas so that it rises up. To make it cheaper, there are regular weather balloons made of latex that are inflated with helium. You release it and with some equipment the whole thing rises for about an hour and a half, reaching a height where the balloon eventually bursts and the equipment lands back on a parachute. This is very cheap, efficient, and quick. We will carry out such a launch soon to test these two communication systems, and most likely, we will conduct another launch to repeat this experiment, regardless of whether the result is good or bad. In any case, we need to repeat it to solidify the findings. This is one system, that is, with a latex balloon, and the other system is a long-duration one, meaning the stratospheric device that will ultimately fly at great distances. Yes, at great distances, ensuring long-lasting communication. For this, a non-latex ball is used, but a ball made of special film, which is much larger. Plus, there is a height adjustment system. And so these data spheres are being crafted with utmost care and attention for us by Bauman according to our order. Together with the guys from Bauman University, we collaboratively, strategically, and meticulously developed this program and tentatively outlined the development of this direction carefully. And they got to work, buying up all the film, by the way, in which these devices are made from such transparent film. In our country, there are only about 16 kilometers of it left, and it is more than 16 kilometers long, about 2 meters wide. In general, it's like a roll. It is absolutely unlikely that anyone will produce more in the near future, so they took all of it. From this film, which is in a roll, petals need to be cut out and these petals welded together, and a sphere is formed. The balloon is filled with helium and it looks just like this. We will show you right now. Show these pictures for longer to help people understand what it looks like. There are images generated by a neural network. They resemble a pumpkin. In the end, this is when the entire shape is formed. 
At the beginning, it looks like this volume of helium. The whole balloon just hangs like a compressed bag. And only then, as it rises up, the pressure outside changes and it keeps being filled, being filled. And eventually, yes, it becomes full and turns into a transparent pumpkin. And now, currently in the workshop, the guys have carefully developed and meticulously assembled two types of welding equipment efficiently and precisely in order to... Well, the cutting equipment is already there. It's nothing complicated. But we have assembled the welding equipment to weld these petals into a single pumpkin. Next week, cutting and welding will be carried out in the construction process on this enormous transparent sphere. We will go film and explain how it all works. At the same time, systems for changing altitude are being developed, like The Americans had such a system, but it did not quite live up to expectations. This is when a membrane is added inside the sphere itself, into which air is pumped. The membrane expands, compressing the helium, and the stratospheric device descends conditionally, so that it does not completely fly out or explode like this. But here, the internal pressure is very strong, and it is necessary to use a very strong material. The system is mediocre. There are several other systems. I will tell you which one we will have, and as for the others, it seems that Kamel once talked about them, so we can repeat that if needed. There will be an additional ballast sphere here, meaning there will be a large one that creates lift together with helium, and there will be a sphere with this... what is it called? A turbine. The mechanism or process that will cause the air to be propelled or moved forward in a specific direction is being discussed. A high-pressure sphere. Several kilograms of air can be drawn into it, thereby weighing down the system. For example, when it is necessary to lower it or release this air through valve. Thus, to raise the altitude. And this is the change in altitude. This is quite a complex thing. First, calculate. Second, coordinate all of this with the wind. Third, ensure that all of this works for a long time. Currently, part of the work on this apparatus is being done by Baumann. That's the latest news at the moment. The welding equipment is ready. The material has been purchased. Next week, we will be cutting, welding, and showing everything. Meanwhile, an advanced and efficient communication system is being developed here. So that's how it is. Well, you have naturally already partially talked about the stratospheric device, right? How it is being prepared. Now I would like to learn more from Dennis about what exactly he did and what technical nuances there might be. To start, Fedya, could you explain again what a stratospheric vehicle is, why it is being launched, and why the company has taken on this direction, since we seem to be talking about airships and some other stratospheric matters? There is the vast atmosphere, there is the expansive stratosphere, there is space, cosmic space, in the vast endless universe. People have learned to fly in helicopters, airplanes, the same airships and balloons. Satellites have been launched into space, while the stratosphere is still free. Naturally, various enthusiastic, passionate and dedicated radio enthusiasts launch similar weather balloons in that particular region there. Periodically, or rather in a regular and consistent manner on a continuous basis, Weather balloons are launched there by the thousands by those who predict the weather, winds, and other related atmospheric phenomena, and so on. However, using the stratosphere as a commercial space to retransmit signals, essentially duplicating the work of satellites, is something everyone dreams of. Even Google was involved in this at one time, but they scaled back the program due to COVID although it was developing quite successfully. In general, everyone wants to occupy the stratosphere for radio communication, internet, television, and so on. Dennis will explain more precisely how all of this works. In order for there to be internet and television in some part of Africa, for example, in a country where there is no connectivity, a satellite must be overhead. Conditionally launch your own satellite is expensive. Yes, otherwise just a few balloons, and that is essentially it, basically. Controlled balloons. Because if you launch a balloon, it flies away. It is blown away by the wind. And now we are moving towards large stratospheric platforms, airship-like, which can carry a couple of tons of equipment. And this is already serious communication. This is really a kind of quasi-state task, actually. But right now, as they say, it's all about commerce. 
They provide services for the government, so it is commercially very attractive to launch such a system. And so the first steps towards that are small devices, developing with Bauman Moscow State Technical University. Height regulation. You choose, change the altitude, select the wind in one direction, then another, then a third, and hover over a specific point. It is clear that the point is large enough, but if there are several devices, they can provide communication for a certain region. That is the purpose of this. It is significantly much cheaper than satellites. It is produced faster and more efficiently. It is developed more quickly, and it provides the same commercial services in the market. It's much simpler. So, it turns out that just a little over two months have passed since the project started, and we are really ready to launch the first device in the coming days. It's not because it's so easy. It's because the guys who joined the team recently have been doing this as their hobby. They all understand that this needs to be done. They went around the offices, knocking on doors, saying that it is very important. Let's open the program. Let's finance all of this. But so far they haven't reached anyone and have been working on it themselves in parallel. Therefore everything was actually ready. They just lacked a bit of funding. This additional funding came from investors and everything started to move quickly. And now we are even beginning to launch. Well, I think it's basically clear and very interesting. Is the launch really going to be on the 27th? It usually depends on the weather. We are guided by the weather. So what could perhaps prevent us from launching it? The weather, some technical nuances? Clear weather, so everything can be seen. If it rains and there is fog, it won't be what was hoped for. Yes. We will be testing two signal transmission systems, real-time video streaming from the stratosphere. We have chosen 200 kilometers. The distance, give or take, is about the range at which stratospheric devices should fly when they are in a swarm, for example, in a cloud. So, conditionally, it is up to 200 kilometers between them. We have considered this model enough, and now we want to lift this system into the air and test everything. Well, for now, it's Earth to air. More precisely, Earth to stratosphere. Then it will be stratosphere to stratosphere. Yes, you can use two balloons and check how they communicate with each other. Yes, there will be live video transmission in good quality, and I don't want to lift it up and look at the clouds. But although the balloon can be launched in a thunderstorm, heavy rain, or snow, this is understandable. Yes, the picture will absolutely just be monotonous indeed. The live broadcast won't be very good, on one hand. On the other hand, we'll all get wet and freeze. Yes. In general, the most interesting part is that this stratospheric device will indeed conduct a live broadcast, transmitting the signal to a computer, and we will try to show you these frames directly from the stratosphere as a webinar, so you can see them from our device. Dennis, can you tell me a little more detail about the power? We have chosen two power levels in one system. There is a bi-directional link at 2.4 gigahertz with a transmitter power of 8 watts, meaning 8 watts on the ground and 8 watts in the stratosphere. The second system also operates at 2.4 gigahertz with a channel width of 100 minihertz and the power can be increased from 0 to 300 watts. This way, we will be able to check what power we need to overcome 200 kilometers, and there is simply no need to lift more than that. Approximately 8 watts seems unrealistic for a distance of 200 kilometers in the stratosphere. Yes, you know, maybe just in case. Let's take approximately 300. This is indeed the maximum, yes. So we will gradually adjust and see what power will actually be needed. So can you explain simply for understanding? Is 300 watts for an antenna too little? That's a lot. What exactly can really be done with 300 watts? Well, this is analogous to approximately 300 watts of light or heat, like an electric hairdryer, for instance, or so. No, but a radio signal antenna with a power of approximately 300 watts is very... 
Well, it depends on the frequency because if you take a range, say, megahertz, 300 watts, then I don't know, the signal will circle the entire Earth, you know. If we take some high frequencies, SVC, radio communication is possible only in line of sight because the signal cannot refract and the power is already, well, both sufficient and insufficient. That is, it needs to be checked. Can you perhaps blow to the moon? You can blow to the moon, yes. You can receive a reflected signal from the moon. 300 power. Certainly indeed, of course. And are we raising the atmosphere? Well, yes, indeed, actually, you know. And when you were conducting the experiment with the laboratory, we were all there. Was it definitely safe? Safe, secure, and sound. Because someone said that a pigeon can be roasted. Well, the thing is that this is not a constant power. It is impulse power, meaning that data packets are sent, and the average power comes out to about a maximum of 30 watts. We don't necessarily have to emit all of this, all 300 watts continuously. Dennis, could you tell us in more detail? Did you build this communication system yourself? Where did you get such skills from to begin with? Tell me about yourself. Where have you worked before and how did you end up in the company? Well, I used to work at Roscosmos just like Fyodor. That's where we met. So that's how I ended up in this company. I am personally interested in radio communication. Accordingly, everything related to radio communication interests me. And along the way, power electronics are also fascinating and intriguing. For example, modern brushless motors, in particular, all operate from inverters based on transistors, such as MOSFETs or IGBTs. Accordingly, by the way, you can develop your own ready-made system for airships. You go... And the charging stations are somewhat ground-based. That is, the airship lands. It can even be wireless. That is, it does not necessarily have to land. It will hover at some distance. And with the help of a magnetic field, using an inductive method, it can charge the vortex battery. That is, the distance is basically tens of meters. It doesn't necessarily have to be landed even. Did you by any chance know anything about airships before Fedor invited you to the company? Not really. Well, I knew about the stratosphere, though. So, tell me, how did you manage to do that? I know you're always in the lab. I came in early today and thought Dennis wasn't here. Please, Fedor, when Dennis arrives we seem to have a broadcast, but Dennis hasn't left the laboratory at all today. So, it's clear that you are passionate, you sit there busy with something. Can you tell us how you did it? What tasks you might have solved within this small project? Yes, it's actually quite simple there. We had a task of about 200 kilometers, and based on my own experience, I know that a power of 300 watts is more than enough, so it can even be reduced. Our antenna system will be directional, meaning that since this is a two-way link, communication will need to occur between the probe and the ground. There will be two transceiver antennas on the probe and two transceiver antennas on the ground. Well, actually, in the field in total, and this will need to be done in some way, that is to deliver full HD video to YouTube or some platform without delays, so there will also be a 4G system on the tower to ensure that we have 100% communication in the field, just in case, in some manner, such as... So is this a PI system? Yes, yes, that is, here is the system for complete video image delivery in internet. Basically, did you assemble it from what is available on the market, or did you just weld the amplifier in yourself? I assembled what I could, well, the best things available on the market, but I had to make some of it myself because the amplifiers, there are two amplifiers in the block. You can't find such things on the market. Firstly, you can't get 300 watts because no one uses such power. It's too much. We had to use our own amplifiers and utilize a ready-made video transmission system because there was no point in developing one now. This resulted in a complete set, a kit. 
It seems that you made the antenna yourselves. We partially made the antennas ourselves because not all antennas available for sale are good. We bought the ones that are good. App, because a good boy was indeed bought, it can be done. We did it ourselves. But if we find a similar item, how much could it cost? Can such a thing be bought somewhere? The system can indeed definitely be assembled in blocks, yes. It costs approximately somewhere around. That is telemetry video transmission plus the transmission of some signals in the range of 900,000, meaning a set. So if it's just about buying for 900,000, there are no such capacities? Yes, that's the minimum available mm. there. It was like a little set. Yes, as you can see, we have specialists who can do this with their own hands. You just say, well, it's simple, to assemble the system. No, yes, it's not complicated. The control system of the dirigible will be much more interesting. Ah, uh, it will be difficult to make the airships communicate with each other in the future, meaning we need to have a global network where all airships can interact and adjust their orbits either ascending or descending. There should be directional antenna arrays installed because the stratospheric airship will derive its energy from the sun, so it cannot carry a lot of battery storage on board. To achieve this, it is necessary in order to safeguard and maintain the signal, and the antenna arrays must be directed effectively in real time to the area where the signal is needed. And if, for instance, a signal is not needed there, it will simply be turned off or switched to sleep mode. Tell me, have you managed to find any new unpatented solutions that may lead to airships due to this development as you mentioned? For example, can this solution be used? Either this solution or we will use tropospheric radio communication that is reflection from the troposphere. Then we could simply reflect off the troposphere and have a communication channel across the entire globe in a straightforward manner. It would indeed even be easier to do effectively. And wherever the dirigible is on the planet, yes, it will always be in touch. Cool, right? This is truly a network of dirigibles. This is a network in reverse. Plus the fact that we have specialists in artificial intelligence and to connect all of this into a common intelligence, it creates a future altogether. Yes. If we also add the idea from Google, Google planned to lift servers on airships to cool them up there. So if you lift up the server capacities, computing power, connect them into one system via tropospheric communication, and attach artificial intelligence, you could already head to the madhouse right now. Dennis, can you tell me what next steps you understand you will be taking within the company, what you will be developing? So, what are we planning to do here? Right now, we are working on the communication system, and then we can focus on the dirigible shell, meaning we will create materials that can also convert solar energy into electricity. That is, in essence, the solar panels are flexible, therefore we need them to weigh as little as possible as a result. The efficiency of these flexible panels should at least match that of these large solid ones, which are very heavy. If we create such a shell, it will be a fully autonomous airship. It won't need anything else. Yes. The guys definitely understand how to really take this shell-like material and effectively coat it with a solar panel. Well, yes. I remember I asked about this too, right? How this can be done. Yes, of course. And solar panels, these technologies already exist, where to get them? Well, they exist, but they are firstly very heavy, meaning we still need a minimal weight, so that it is a very thin layer of semiconductor. Yes, as you correctly said, we will be spraying it. That is, essentially, layer by layer deposition can be done either directly on pieces of the shell, or one can take a ready-made shell and deposit it gradually. Well, that's clear there. Experiments can vary. I have a question now as a viewer. You are involved in radio communication and power electronics, but what about coding? Well, it's vacuum technology. I'm interested in it too. Are you interested in this by any chance? I am partially involved in this. Yes, it's actually quite interesting. In fact, it's quite broad. 
Our vacuum technology specialist is Artem, and when we say that Dennis is a radio physicist, he is actually studying a lot of plasma as well. There! Plasma spraying will be used, and if you need to generate something like ball lightning, or a plasma toroid, or plasma fire 3 meters tall, or lightning 20 meters long, you can come here. And what else is planned? We are planning to conduct an experiment with hops. Accordingly, here in the laboratory in this controlled environment, we are building a miniature model of a dirigible and trying to ionize hydrogen. That is, in order to ionize and heat it by utilizing either hydrogen or the element gel. Why is this? In order to guarantee its greater load capacity and stability, and so that it can float, that is, either simply lower it by heating, or when you don't heat it, it will land. Yes, they generally have a notion. Dimitri Kmel is overflowing with these brilliant ideas, which some members of the team do not accept because they are experimental. Experimental designs are not always easy to test right away. One can build a helium airship, but adding a heating system for the helium is necessary. It is already an airship. It flies as it is and can carry cargo, and everything is fine with that. But if, for example, there is a task to bring a little more cargo on the same dirigible, there is a solution to simply heat the helium. On one hand, it sounds simple to heat it, but on the other hand, it's not just that simple. One of the solutions is to heat it with plasma torches, conditionally. And if something needs to be heated with a plasma torch, you can turn to Dennis. Either with a plasma torch, or it is possible to heat a large local area. That is, ionize it and gradually it will gain degrees. That is, with radio waves. Choose a radius of exposure, let's say, some piece and heat it like this. Here, this is one idea, that is, just to create such a heating system, just to test it, to see how effective it is, roughly speaking because it will have some weight. It will consume a certain amount of energy. Well, there should be some advantages to consider. And to compare all of this, there is also a second breakthrough idea. I have heard about it too. It is also related to gas ionization. There, in general, cold plasma can be ignited, and there will be no heating. But at the same time, all the same advantages will remain. I think we won't discuss this for now. In general, what we have here is serious scientific work in the company. It's not like we just bought some pieces somewhere in China or Russia, assembled some device and took off. We do a lot ourselves, and in order to accomplish something, we first need to test it. For this, a laboratory is exactly what we need to conduct various experiments and more. Department of Advanced Technologies. This could be the name of the laboratory. So can we expect that perhaps some patents will start to appear? Of course. Is there such a task, right? Task. Why not? In short, everything can be patented starting today. The question is, why? Well, first of all, it indeed somehow shows, I think, a certain status of the company. No. If we make a highly innovative, advanced and flexible solar panel, it will definitely need to be patented. Well, plus an asset is also like an intangible asset, which can also serve as a foundation for the company, and it's great that we understand, or rather have the opportunity to do this to create certain innovations, because this project turns out to be quite science intensive, as it involves a lot of detailed and complex scientific research. Of course, we will patent it. I just have a personal attitude towards it, which has nothing to do with the collective opinion of the company. And the fact that the patent system in general is a rather questionable thing. Well, yes, that's exactly it. You can just patent it, but you can also open those patent search engines. And there's so much that's been patented, yet there's nothing here. We're almost living in the Stone Age compared to what's been patented. My opinion is this. It's better to have one working device that isn't patented than to have 20 non-working ones that are, no matter how cool and patented they are. Well, for us, as a commercial organization, it makes no sense to patent everything, because I know that in state enterprises, sometimes employees are rewarded for this, and they create some patents, but it's unclear who needs them. They just sit somewhere. We need those patents that will bring in money. On the other hand, people often write that, on the contrary, it's better not to patent anything. People will just copy your ideas, steal them, so it's better to let them sit here where no one knows about them. We have an extremely highly qualified specialist who is specifically in the field of patent studies. I think we will connect him to the project soon. 
and he will tell us. It is clear that we will need to patent something. This is necessary to simply protect our commercial component in the project. We can fantasize as much as we want. The specialist will tell us what to do, and we will do just that, of course. Regarding the laboratory and what will be happening there in general, as I understand you have your own YouTube channel. In one of the videos they already talked about this. I don't know if this activity will be covered there or not. Or if it's some kind of your personal... No, you can access the YouTube channel, of course. We'll just send the link somewhere, then, a bit. What is happening in the laboratory? You can subscribe to Dennis's YouTube channel. There you also post some of your personal experiments. As I understand it, you even have an audience 25,000 subscribers. Dennis, you see, is such a specialist. In fact, the field is narrow. It's not for everyone. Very narrow. Yes, but considering that you have such a large number of followers on such a narrow topic, it means you really understand what you are showing. And that is interesting. Yes. And what's funny is that recently, regarding the control system, Ilya came to the office. Ilya was working on the control system for U30, specifically doing it hands-on, and Dennis brought Ilya to the office. When Ilya got here, they just... Ilya texts Dennis, asking if he is really working on the airship. Dennis replies, Yes, where is it? Ilya came here and saw Boris Alexandrovich and Vadim Vasilyevich. They are looking at each other and he asks, What are you doing here? This is how specialists meet in a variety of different professional settings and collaborate and exchange ideas. So, it's like our community, right? Engineers, people who are passionate about science and technology, people who are into science. Yeah, technology. I guess that's one way to put it. Very wild. Well, that's that. And also, as far as I know, our department will somehow have something like that. Hello, Promising Technologies. Our department is focused on advanced technologies. Our Department of Advanced Technologies will have its own media resource. You will post your experiments there, what you are doing. It will also be possible to subscribe and directly follow your experiments. By the way, just to mention, by the way. The equipment is coming soon, as I understand it. We are all waiting for Pavel the operator. Operator, yes. From the 1st of November, we have no, the 24th, approximately one week left. And finally, in a week, we will have an operator and more content. Friends. Just hang in there for another week. Yes, but as I understand it, the guys are also planning to film it live, right? But someone still definitely needs to assemble it, upload it, and process it. Yes, that's right. There will be more content. As I said, we are still sometimes filming ourselves. Today I was walking and saw Melad. By the way, I think next week we will also film an interview with Melad, where we will show you one of the people who is developing the control system for our flying vehicles. I think it will be interesting. So, well, I think we can slowly move on to the questions. Dennis, maybe you want to add something from yourself. You mentioned that you haven't heard much about airships, but you knew about stratospheric devices. Perhaps you have worked with them in some way. I am very much fascinated in the stratosphere itself because of its communication radius and its potential for future advancements. That is, it is not necessary to use two points somewhere. To set up high masts, for example, 300 to 500 meters tall, one can simply irradiate the stratosphere and the signal will travel through it like through a pipe. That is, like through a waveguide. So, in a detailed and comprehensive manner, accordingly, it can be thoroughly checked through stratospheric probes. And you are, let's say, the most interesting perspective direction in the stratosphere, right? And here it is specifically about providing communication in some hard-to-reach areas. Mm. Yes, Fedor basically talked about the same thing, but are there any other potentially interesting directions? Well, we can certainly perform there, as this probe can carry out certain tasks. To measure something in the stratosphere, for example, solar radiation, or some kind of activity, or to fly over volcanoes and capture footage of them, or to document natural disasters, in other words, video recording, to fixate. On one hand. On the other hand, yes, these scientific instruments, radiation, compositions, temperatures, wind directions, everything in between. That is, science, monitoring, communication. Forecasting any kind of cataclysms and disasters? It should already be a complete system. Can this somehow be called something analogous to Starlink? 
What Elon Musk is doing with satellites? They perform roughly the same tasks as the satellite group. They have pure internet. In essence, it is possible to use the stratospheric communication system purely over the internet. This is what Google Luna was working on, but it was shut down due to COVID. However, they had successful experiments, providing stable internet in some areas where it previously did not exist, thanks to the stratospheric device. And how many days did that apparatus hang in the air exactly, Fedi, for the record in Russia? But this is just... Four days. In the Soviet Union, they flew for a longer time, while in modern Russia, it's slightly more. Four days. In other words, our task to break the record in this direction for Russia is to create a device in the first stage that can fly for more than four days. That would already be great. In fact, it is planned that it will be in the air for a period of approximately a month or so, but it is unknown. Because what has actually been achieved in modern Russia is four days. Our device will hang for a week, which will already break that record by two times. The only task that needs to be done, and it is crucial to understand, is if we fully comprehend that our very first experimental devices, well, that everything is going to deviate significantly from solving the task at hand. It is necessary to control its detachment at the right point, so the equipment descends to a location convenient for us to retrieve. Here is one of those interesting tasks, and it is actually clear, solvable, and so on. Just so you understand too. To land it in a controlled manner so that it doesn't fall somewhere. To America, for example. Either in the swamp, yes, potentially. For example, landing it in a field. It is preferable to be on the territory of our country. By the way, was that Chinese balloon that caused such a stir in the USA exactly a stratospheric device? Yes, it was a light, small device with some kind of cheerful little payload. So, did he make them a bit bigger? Did he fly there by accident or not? Yes. In fact, the monitoring system for such very small devices is practically non-existent. And such stratospheric devices with minimal microsatellites are currently flying over many countries. Yes, because they are radio transparent, it is difficult to detect them with anything if something is flying, and they are not detected by anything. They exist as both amateur radio and purposefully spy devices or instruments in their functionality. And the fact that they very much noticed it is likely just that something slightly went wrong for the Chinese. They should not have noticed. We will still build large devices that will be noticeable, understandable. They will be registered, have their own coordinates, a messaging system, and so on. We won't play with such small ones. Right now, what we are going to launch is conditionally small, but in reality, we will demonstrate something larger. Well, you know, it is just a simple and straightforward testing. Naturally. So you say that the system is coming together, there will be a grouping of such devices, and you also mentioned stratospheric platforms. Is this the next step? Yes, that's basically it. The stratospheric probe, roughly speaking, is an unmanned device that ascends, explodes, and the equipment lands on a parachute. During the ascent and descent, it performs some useful work. The next stage is when it is carefully controlled. In the process, it limits a certain height. Everything is already working much longer than there, one and a half hours, a couple of hours, one day, or even four days, which is a record for Russia. It flew somewhere, and the next stage is even longer. For example, it's not just four days, but at least a couple of weeks. One device worked for a couple of weeks, and you release them as a whole squadron, with a distance of literally about 200 kilometers between them. They fly and provide some useful work, in terms of communication, for example. The next stage involves a slightly larger device, but already with engines that not only move vertically, but also select the wind and navigate accordingly. You still have to rely on the wind, a micro airship. Yes. The next device is one that fights against the wind. It can change altitude and can row against the wind or with the wind. This is already an airship particularly controlled. Although it also resembles an airship in terms of height, ideologically it is not. But in the next stage it is such a device, and after it a large stratospheric platform that hovers in one spot and hangs there, completely indifferent to which direction the winds are blowing. 
She took a lot of energy on board, which is in the solar panels. She didn't take just 5 kilograms of payload like here, but 500 kilograms, a ton or two tons. This is already completely different equipment, and this is already a platform. And is a stratospheric airship the next step? It is indeed a platform. A stratospheric platform and a stratospheric airship are the same thing. Everything is clear. We have the ideal of a stratospheric airship, and our first step is the launch of the first device Sunday, if we simplify it completely. But at the same time, it is also a separate commercial direction that is interesting in itself. Yes, yes, in the current realities. Both our country and undoubtedly many of our friendly countries absolutely simply need such communication systems. Moreover, Russia is such a vast and expansive country where both transportation, including air transport, is absolutely essential and indispensable, and there are many remote and challenging regions where it is difficult to ensure communication. Yes, but for example, such small stratospheric probes will not be able to provide communication across all territories of Russia. Even in the Arctic zone, this circular current also breaks down, and it is periodic depending on the winter, summer, and so on. Therefore, we need controlled stratospheric platforms so that we are not completely dependent on the currents. Such platforms are useful for our country. However, for example, descending into the equatorial zone, where these currents are year-round, one can manage with probes. So, most likely the probes are either for the pole regarding weather, more precisely for the season, and for the equator, where one can experiment with probes. However, for our country, for the northern latitudes, and for northern countries in general, these are still large, serious stratospheric platforms. Well, a platform is, in essence, primarily launch pads for rockets and satellites. There is an idea, yes, among many, that a solid fuel rocket can be easily launched with microsatellites from a stratospheric platform. Like... Is it possibly cheaper, you think, then? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? It's not that it's cheaper. It's just like another... Everyone will launch rockets, too. You have a rocket, and in it, there's a big satellite. Next to a large satellite, microsatellites are usually placed if they are on the same path. For example, in the same orbit. It will all continue to fly, but it just appears that the platform takes off anyway, so why not take a couple of solid fuel rockets with microsatellites on board and launch them? Well, returning to our launch once again, we can now specify the exact time when it will happen. As I remind you, the live broadcast will be on social media, and you can see for yourselves how it will all take off. The question is, what time? It is indeed possible to watch HD quality live from the stratosphere without delays, taxes, or overcharges. What time? Is it still in question, or do we get it yet? Look, if everything goes perfectly, as planned, we will hopefully start the broadcast early on Sunday at lunch. From the field, just... From the field. 90 minutes before launch, we will announce it then. Everything will be ready in exactly an hour and a half. Well, around approximately 2 p.m., 1 o'clock, 3, so it depends on how... To get to the point, let's say Friday or Saturday, we will determine the exact time of departure. And it really depends on the weather. If we wake up in the morning and there's a hurricane and a snowstorm, then, you know. Theoretically, around noon at one o'clock, let's estimate that we have already taken off, give or take. Therefore, we will approximately start the broadcast somewhere around 12, 11 o'clock. Because if it begins its ascent at approximately one o'clock, it will only reach its peak at 2.30 and will start descending on the parachute system. At 3.30 it seems to have descended. Uh -huh. We ascertained, using advanced technology by GPS beacons, that it descended 150 km into a swamp. Even to the swamp, for example. And we will go to pick him up with a live broadcast. The main thing is that it should not be in the city or in the village. All of this is calculated. We will understand about the landing zone, and most likely, when it starts descending, at some point part of the group will already go to meet it. In general, it will be fun. And look at how everything is being built.
We will talk in more detail about how everything is arranged and watch the stratosphere live without delays. Taxes and overpayments and how we search for it selected, all of this will be one big tech webinar, I hope on Sunday. Yes, we are leaving ourselves an exit strategy. Yes, there may be bad weather, so there is a risk that we won't launch. If not this Sunday, then it will be in a week. Maybe the weather on Mars will play a role. Yesterday, we tested a powerful video transmission system that Dennis assembled a few days ago. Everything worked perfectly. Yesterday, we conducted an experiment on the electromagnetic compatibility of low power and high power devices. And in the powerful system, everything worked, but there was no video. By the way, did you fix it? Yes, I fixed everything. What was the problem? In the antenna connector. The antenna? Yes, 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 he was there punishing. Transmitter. Transmitter. That's what I'm literally telling you. So, is that board alive, small? Yes, the board is live. In short, to pry it out, a piece got stuck, it broke off, plus there's a latch. Yesterday, there was nothing to do. I needed to solder it carefully and pull it out. In general, if the weather on Mars doesn't get worse and everything is fine with the instruments, then yes, on Sunday at noon. But why are there launches specifically on weekends? Perhaps we are not on the weekend. We can but they may not approve them. In short, the launch can be approved or not approved. If the launch is not coordinated, there will be such a powerful system created by Dennis that it will be seen first of all on all radars. What is it? Yes. Yes, they will all be called, asked if it's yours, and everyone will say it's not ours and problems may arise. Or it could be shot down in front of us, some F-300 or something. Yes, they will look for us too, of course. Therefore, it is better to coordinate the launch of such powerful systems. We have coordinated it. And of course, the military coordinates it, as they usually do, you know. How are they doing there? Where did you, sir? To the flight zone. Air defense in general. They only coordinate on Saturday and Sunday because from Monday to Friday they mostly conduct their exercises so that we do not interfere with them. Therefore, only on weekends. Yes, the question here is whether it has been agreed upon with the authorities. It has been agreed to launch this Sunday. Yes, people are asking about that too. I saw the comments. Well, let's gradually move on to the questions. Here, they are asking about the coordination about and collaboration and how they plan to execute it. Stratospheric airships. Well, let's take a look. Several people are asking about Kirillin in connection with the fact that there was talk about whether Kirillin wanted to launch these devices or not. Can you comment on that again? Someone is asking how Kirillin is doing health-wise and when he will appear. In general, all questions on this topic. Kirillin is recovering. Those who saw him at the conference noticed that it was very difficult for him to move, and this was all because he lifted some heavy object. When moving quickly and efficiently to MAI, the rector was running from one floor to another, and the students were helping. He didn't give them any documentation, took everything himself. In general, he delivered it, and something happened to his foot, then to his knee, and then in general, his whole leg started to hurt. In general, their health wasn't all that great, but he ran slightly into battle, and we launched the project anyway. And so, after the project was launched, he focused on his health because work is being organized and established here. Everything is fine. The last time we visited him, he was already moving around cheerfully with one cane. But of course, he still needs time to recover. Because running around the offices like this right away, the main thing is to understand that the project is not standing still. The team of airship operators that you saw at the conference, they work in the office. Zubkevich, Ivchenko, Kamel. Those you saw are all working. In fact, there are so many specialists. We are organizing the work together. The last time I counted, there were already approximately 26 people. And this is quite enough not only to launch the first airship, it already forms the main backbone of the future design bureau. Because to lift the same U-30, they had a core team of just over approximately 10 people. 
So it turns out to be three times more. At approximately two or so, perhaps, for now. Dennis, they are asking you if you have ever assembled such communication systems for stratospheric devices, or if this is your first time. I dealt with tropospheric radio communication specifically, but I didn't assemble it since I had it ready. I have a satellite communication system at home so I could contact Voyager, but there's no task for that. In other words, I have a lot of things at home. That is, specifically, there are kilowatt power amplifiers for broadband LWB covering a frequency range from approximately 3 gigahertz to 15 gigahertz in total, respectively. Accordingly, if any kind of extreme communication is needed, it can be organized in a manner that is absolutely necessary and effectively managed. So, is the Vajra already somewhere out there? Yes, it is most assuredly already beyond the solar system. So we can even communicate with aliens, right? Or at least check... But we will have to wait for the signal to arrive. Well, it will take too long for the clothing to fly. Well... Then let's establish and develop hyperspace radio communication effectively, since everything is possible, in order to achieve our goals. Thus, the question is, in general, about the greatest possible height at which passenger airships will fly? Passenger airships will be of two types. The first type has non-hermetic cabins and operates at an altitude of two and a half kilometers, which is the permitted height to ensure comfort for everyone, including children, adults and seniors. In reality, there is no need to fly higher. The altitude will likely be around 500 meters, as there is no point in flying higher. And the second type of airships will have sealed cabins, where there is no ceiling as such allowing one to rise even into the aerosphere. The question is, yes, what direction the device will take. It will be a high-speed airship, for example, flying at altitudes from 5 to 8 kilometers. They can operate within this range. Either it will be a stratospheric airship or a supersonic one, which would operate at altitudes from 10 to 15 kilometers. Ideally, it should also be tourist-friendly, allowing it to rise to 25 kilometers. Well, that's just a stratospheric elevator. Can you theoretically fly to the moon in an airship? No. To the moon? It will probably just be slow, right? No. Or is it impossible to make it that airtight? No, no. The problem is that the airship in general generates its lift from the environment it is in. And when the atmosphere ends, the lift ends. Well, you can push with engines later. It turns out the opposite. This is only if you transport helium-3 from the moon with an airship, then it's possible, yes. But if you attach a dirigible to rocket engines and connect the dirigible system at some point to the rocket engines and proceed further, then it is possible. Then you can land the stratospheric platform back and attach the dirigible to this balloon. This is exactly what we are just doing on Sunday. We will try to take the first step in this direction. Well, you know, it's not exactly a step, it's just something like that, perhaps. Test. Yes, essentially, it's basically about closing a couple of issues for the developer guys who have been moving in this direction all the time. And it's still, in fact, a company's our big project. Yes, because an airship is a complex system and there is a lot that can be tried. Yes, and this welding system for shells, which is currently being assembled at Bauman for us, the project participants, is conditional. Yes, the same system will be used. That airship, the first demonstrator, will be soft, a drone. But the task is to build rigid large airships, and inside the rigid large airship there will be gas bags. And these gas bags will most likely be made from the same films that are currently used to make the large stratospheric umbrella, and to have your own welding machine and established technology. You see, we seem to be building a stratospheric device, but it feels like we are already doing something. Well, yes, yes, of course. Listen, is this particular film some kind of Russian film? This is the one we just bought. Yes, it is Russian. And there is a company in Russia capable of producing it, but they will not produce it until someone orders a thousand kilometers of this film. So the technologies exist, but they are not in high demand, right, as of today? And how many kilometers is that? Approximately, how far will the stat stats last if we calculate? Well, let us count together 
and then after the very informative and important webinar session in the Telegram channel. That should be enough for a while. By the way, regarding the next steps, the nearest ones, this is the first launch. What other launches are planned, and when will they take place? Is something planned for November? By the end of November, a large transparent apparatus with adjustable height needs to be launched, one that is extremely long-lasting, durable, highly efficient, and exceptionally reliable. Everything will be clear and well prepared on it. Most likely, two will be made. If the first flies successfully, we will not release the second. If the first flies with some... Depending on the force majeure, we will either proceed with the second launch or wait. And based on this launch or the two launches, it will be clear what needs to be improved in the apparatus. During the winter months, roughly December, January and February, these systems will be refined and the grouping will be completed. The grouping will then be launched in the spring. So, it turns out that spring is not far from the dirigibles in terms of timing. Not far, right? In terms of timing. So, let's look at the questions further. I am currently looking at the questions on vContacte. You can write questions where you are watching. I will be watching on vContacte on YouTube of the State Managed Generation. I will also check Rutube and the YouTube channel of Solar Group. Don't forget to like and share. Well, as you are all undoubtedly aware, you all know why this is needed. Therefore, it is indeed absolutely essential. A person writes extensively about dirigibles in great detail in the upper stratosphere. How complex is this task? How many years might it take? No one has ever built stratospheric dirigibles on the planet throughout the entire history of human civilization. The first to build stratospheric dirigibles are practically the first person to fly to the moon. This is indeed a very complicated task. Fortunately, it is being resolved in the 21st century as we speak. And according to current ongoing estimates, in approximately five to six years, it can most likely be expected that such a working platform will already be in operation in the air. Yes. But many are trying now, right? I mean, there are periodic news reports like that. Well, not many, but some are trying. Recently, the Americans launched a capsule into the stratosphere with people inside. But this capsule is analogous to our stratospheric probes. It's just a balloon. This capsule is simply huge. It rose up, then descended down. This is not a dirigible. Indeed, they dream of building a dirigible, but they haven't even attempted to try yet. Although in our country the Ministry of Defense has clearly defined the task, they need high-altitude stratospheric platforms. This is not about probes. It is specifically about dirigibles. Difficult, long, expensive, but profitable and significant, which is indeed a process that requires patience and dedication to achieve success. Well, not the first person on the moon, but certainly, as you might know, the first satellite in space. Well, let's see how this turns out for us. More precisely, let's say how quickly we can actually indeed, in fact, make it happen. It's absolutely fantastic that we are indeed very much thinking about this and moving towards it. But people often ask about it too. They often find it very interesting. In other words, it seems that everyone thinks about this, wants it, but so far it hasn't worked out. Here's a question. Let me ask you this. Hypothetically speaking, if the stratospheric vehicle is going with the wind, wouldn't it be simpler, perhaps, to make it in the shape of a perfect cube to effectively minimize waste? Let me elaborate on this. Well, it won't be possible to cook it in the shape of a cube in any case. The pressure will expand it, and it will resemble something like, again, a pumpkin. Well, a pumpkin with distinct peaks, yes, certainly indeed, a very sharp pumpkin indeed. Making special structures inside to form a cube shape would add weight to the apparatus. There probably isn't much point in doing that. So, they are asking about two systems. Regarding cost reduction, one can use a regular method, meaning that a film is produced with a cylindrical tube, simply sealed at the top and bottom. Sausage. Yes, just two seams and here you go. But these are lightweight probes that can be controlled in height, and such have even been designed and tested here on Earth, primarily designed for Mars or Venus. These lightweight probes are not only easy to manage, but also offer flexibility in their operation. They are specifically engineered to function optimally in extraterrestrial environments. 
Dmitry Sergeyevich Kamel can tell you more precisely in a comprehensive and detailed manner about such systems. What about these two communication systems? How do they differ? Why are there two? Is it for safety and for something else? Firstly, duplication. Secondly, they are of different power levels. One is 8W, the other is 300W. If... Um, the frequencies are basically the same. That is, 2.4 is essentially the permitted microwave frequency. You can use any power there. It's because, well, all the microwaves are working simultaneously and they all emit a significant amount of electromagnetic interference into the surrounding air, which can affect various electronic devices and communication systems. One system, for instance, has two Wi-Fi channels, each with a bandwidth of up to 50 megabits per second, allowing you to transmit a variety of data, including video streams, audio files, or any other digital content through it efficiently. The second system is dedicated solely to handling full HD video and telemetry data, ensuring high quality video transmission and accurate telemetry readings. The frequency used by both systems is the same, which can sometimes lead to overlapping signals, but they are designed to manage this effectively. Channel width is 50 MHz, second 100 MHz, wider and stronger, power up to 300 W excessive. The channel width is 50 MHz, and my second one is 100. It is wider and more powerful, with a power of up to 300 watts, which is somewhat excessive, uh, and so on. Count on the duplicate copies. If one doesn't work, we will have a second, additional options, and reliable, or even a third one. Yes, the first one is currently assembled from what is available on the market, while the second one is assembled and refined to be extremely powerful, and we will test its power at a distance to see what results we get. Here the power control system is in place, and the apparatus will move away. We know what power is currently being used, and we observe that the signals are deteriorating. We can increase the power and will draw the complete dependence of distance on power, which will help us understand this better. A person undoubtedly and clearly writes that the launch of a dirigible into the stratosphere is indeed an event of global significance. Although it seems that there is not yet a dirigible in the stratosphere, but this is about what will be in the future. Yes, that is what we are striving for. And he says that in this regard, Everyone should be interested, including the president. For this, they might as well completely and thoroughly disperse the clouds over the launch site. As they often wisely say, you really need to reach out for help, support, and guidance if it becomes necessary. Dennis can once more assemble the system for dispersing clouds using dirigibles in order to achieve the desired effect. By the way, that would be interesting. It can be done as an experiment. Meanwhile, Dennis was merely assembling a system that, in fact, on the contrary, collected clouds. So, I'm looking at the questions on YouTube on the dirigibles of the New Generation channel. And by the way, we have a lot of viewers watching us. I see here on YouTube there are only 27 likes, which is unacceptable. I remember when we held a contest, there were as many as 200 likes. So I know you can like the video. Please, don't be lazy, make reposts, and hit the like button. If we can get at least 100 likes on our YouTube stream, that would be great, because it all helps promote the project. And here's the first question on YouTube. Are we brothers in the project? Yes, indeed, we have the same last name, Denisov Filipov. We have already told Fyodor that he can make wishes, but we still haven't figured out whether we are brothers or not. So far, it seems there isn't anything preliminary, although both, as they say, have relatives from Tula. Who knows? This is very suspicious. Very suspicious, yes, we are already all over this. They are also approximately the same height and have hair of roughly the same color. So yes, everyone is actually already joking about it, but, you know, we weren't familiar with Dennis. We met maybe a year ago. So let's see. Maybe, who knows, perhaps some common relatives will be found. It will be fascinating. They are asking to conduct the webinars more energetically. Well, friends. The next one will definitely, absolutely be as incredibly energetic as possible with the launch, with great enthusiasm and excitement. I suggest perhaps playing some uplifting music in the background of the webinar. It would actually indeed make it a bit easier for me too, because sitting in silence and talking alone, there is really, truly, indeed, in fact, quite difficult. Absolutely. You can certainly try. You can indeed try. Yes, indeed. I put it in the background. It would definitely actually bring it to life, I really think about that. So they are writing, wow, what a cool idea, and so on. So, 
What is the cost of the apparatus relative to its payload capacity? What specific instruments, apparatus or equipment? This is probably about the stratospheric zone in the atmospheric layer. Or about the dirigible. It should be clearly and explicitly clarified that there was indeed actually an unspoken rule in the earlier times, which still very much exists among all dirigible operators, that 1,000 cubic meters costs $1 million. That is, a dirigible with a volume of 1,000 cubic meters will be sold to the customer for $1 million. 1,000 cubic meters can lift 1,000 kilograms, but this is a rough estimate. The shell will weigh something, for example, 150 kilograms. The engine will weigh something, the gondolas and so on, for example, another 300 kilograms. But here, a kilogram is conditionally 500, 1,000 cubic meters, but actually it's less, 100. 1,000 cubic meters will be able to lift. Here, for $1 million, 2,000 cubic meters will be sold. For $2 million, 3,000 cubic meters will be sold. Here, a 10-ton vehicle has a volume of 15, 20,000 cubic meters, which costs 15, 20 million dollars. There is an unspoken rule among all dirigible enthusiasts that seems to persist, and this rule is often discussed in dirigible enthusiast forums. And of course, we want to break it because dirigibles will not see widespread use with such pricing, as it is a topic of interest and debate among those passionate about airship. Just out of thin air. Well, let it be so. In reality, it's not like that. Because having mastered the shells and the control system, of course engines and so on can also be done, but it's not necessary. As a result, the apparatus can be made much cheaper in terms of overall cost, efficiency and affordability. Why discuss engines with anyone else when we have Sobelmash, as you might already know? Everything is said correctly, as you know. And indeed, the very first place we went with the dirigible pilots was Sobelmash. Dmitry Alexandrovich Duvenov. They communicated and agreed that when a clear technical specification for the electric engines is formed, it will be sent to Sovelmash, and Sovelmash in turn will respond with the time frame in which it can develop the engine according to this specification. And now we are currently and carefully forming the layout of the first dirigible step by step in a detailed manner. It will either be one power unit with rotating screws and a rotating transmission, a fuel-based power unit such as diesel or petrol engines which are commonly used in various applications will be absolutely mandatory. Either it will be essentially one power unit with a non-adjustable propeller, then in total two electric motors will be needed to create a vector of thrust. Plus, there will be one at the back. We just need a little more time, then we will understand how many electric motors will be on the dirigible, formulate the technical specifications, and head to Sovelmash. Yes, as you might already be aware, it was indeed actually explicitly mentioned at the Scientific and Technical Council, and we introduced the dirigible enthusiasts, who were indeed very much passionate, to Dmitri Sanish. They extremely enthusiastically attended a very prestigious army event in the year of 2024, and were in Zelenograd, and they also mentioned that if the stated characteristics, the weight and power characteristics align with reality, which cannot be disputed, these are amazing engines. They must be used without fail. Yes, Sovelmash is continuing its active work on them. Today, I spoke with Alexander Sudarev about the conference that will take place on November 16th. Whether these engines can be shown at the conference is still in question, especially since Sovelmash is currently testing them actively. A lot is changing in various sectors and industries, and I strongly believe that by the time it is needed for the airship, the technology required for the airship will be not only available but also highly advanced and efficient. Are you planning to use flexible solar cells on the surface and electric drives for the propellers? Well, they were talking right, you know. We plan to cover the shell with flexible solar panels and we will absolutely definitely do it. But if you listened a little bit, Dennis indeed said that in the Department of Advanced Technologies, the technology of spraying solar panels directly onto the shell of the airship will be tested. So that it would be like a sandwich, not just once. The composite material is both strong and gas-retaining, and it also generates energy. By the way, we always talk about soft envelopes, but soft airships are just the first step towards rigid airships. Rigid airships can be made from composite panels, and those panels will not be flexible as such. They will be rigid. So, can solar panels be applied to the cells? Yes.
This task is much simpler and more efficient than using a cloth, making the entire process easier and more effective overall. So the main question is indeed, what is a compass for? This seems to be a question about... The compass seems to lack an enterprise management system. In addition to CAD, CAM, and CAE, a top-level system, PLM, is also needed. So, Arthur is asking two questions. The first one is, can an airship be made transparent? It is possible. The question is why, so that he does not see. Stealth. So, it actually turns out that the balloon will be transparent? It can be made transparent up to a certain dimension, yes. Beyond that dimension, it is unlikely. Yes, from the perspective of some kind of espionage. It's dangerous. If a plane is flying, it simply won't see it. But it's like a jellyfish, can you imagine? Yes, like an air jellyfish, by the way. Nature-like. Well, yes, and it's generally clear how this can be applied. Well, if you actually send one person there, just think about it. It's like some kind of bird. So, there is absolutely no need to fly somewhere at all. Well, if you indeed make the propulsion system electrostatic, then there should be a motor there as well. Well, yes, indeed, if you really need to cross to a specific point somewhere. The second question, how does the ambient temperature affect the characteristics of the airship? For example, from minus 50 to plus 50. Well, the temperature impacts the entire gas system. The gas becomes denser or expands. Because of this, when designing an airship, it is designed specifically for certain climatic conditions. He must likely have a reserve. <coughs> there is an air gas system, or perhaps even more efficiently, that either compresses helium to... But again, which airship are we talking about? The rigid one or the soft one? If it's a soft airship, it needs to constantly maintain internal pressure to keep its shape. Well, the shape should be aerodynamic, not deflated. Yes, there is an internal gas system with bags for this purpose. That is, if it gets very cold outside, the helium will start to contract, and the bags must be designed to such a volume that the helium, so to speak, shrinks to a certain volume at minus 50 degrees, and air needs to be pumped in up to a certain size. Then the same airship flies into the heat. The helium starts to expand, and to prevent it from deflating, these air systems must somehow make room for the helium so that the outer shell does not tear at the seams, and it must be rigid. But this is again soft. With a rigid design, it's pretty much the same, but there are no problems with the shell tearing. With air systems, everything is different. In general, States have different conditions, and all engineering solutions are laid out for various climatic conditions from the start, so temperature will not affect it in any way. The higher the temperature, the greater the lift force will be. In other words, it's only a positive effect. When there is abnormal heat, there will be approximately an additional kilogram. Well, in some various parts of Dubai, that is basically it. There are a few questions about the stratospheric device. First, what will it be filled with? Helium or hydrogen? Helium. And immediately, an additional question, will it be able to lift higher on hydrogen? Can you do it now, please? But helium is just safer, right? Yes, indeed, we already have a ceiling of 25 kilometers, which is quite high. And here is the next question. What height should it exactly, perhaps, ideally reach? Approximately around 25 kilometers. That is, it will rise to 25 kilometers. And all of this can be watched live, I remind you, on Sunday, if nothing happens with the weather. Yes, if the weather is good, it is visible. Yes, by the way, technically interesting, because when I first heard about it, I was surprised. Yes, and it will be possible to observe its ascent. Yes, and beautiful. Will it be 1.5 hours, just for the ascent? And then sideways for 100 kilometers. There is more ascent, just ascent, one and a half times the ascent. God willing, we will reach 100 kilometers. And how it will fall in detail and specifics. Not to fall, but to descend using a parachute system. Is the broadcast going to be that long? Will it start half an hour early, so we can see how everything is being set up? We will be broadcasting almost all day. From the moment we deploy this system until the moment we find it. 
I understood it will be possible to set it up like on a TV and watch movies throughout the day for about five hours. It can be turned off. Then watch it later, turn it on. Well, great, yes, I think that, especially if our viewers help, we can spread such a broadcast well. So, what amount will trigger the transition to the first stage? One million dollars? Two and a half million dollars? People are planning their investments. Dennis, closer to the conference, closer to November 16th. We plan to resolve this question as well. We still have a few questions there, about which we mentioned that some figures may still change, deadlines may change, and tasks may change, because we are currently in the pre-launch phase. Our goal is to finalize everything for the conference, and we will officially announce it. For now, at this moment, we have absolutely no changes here, in the sense that we definitely talked about a million dollars, as long as we keep that mark. It is very likely that we will keep the value of 2.5, as we initially planned. Will there be a backup recording of the lift on the GoPro? Yes, of course. So will the GoPro be attached? There will be many cameras. Many cameras they'll record by themselves, plus they'll give live broadcast. Yes. Well, the recording will probably remain like what was with the live broadcast. Oh, of course, yes. Many materials remain on flash drives. This is potentially a question in case the connection drops so that everything is ready in the event that it happens afterwards. What materials will be used for the shells of large airships weighing over 200 tons? Will they be made of titanium or some other materials? Shells. Shells are written. Or frames. The frames are unlikely to be made of titanium. There will probably be a composite skeleton. Based on what? Probably on carbon fiber. Yes. There will be composite panels on the outside. All of this will be covered. Again, most likely carbon fiber. Part of the panels, which are efficiently and effectively utilized with applied solar panels for energy generation. I don't know if composites will be made from metal and if it will be titanium. It's unlikely to be expensive. Well, there's also the additional weight. Because carbon, if it will be the frame, will be significantly lighter. Noticeably more so in comparison to other materials. Well, what do you mean by metallic carbon? Well, yes, indeed, absolutely. All of this will be calculated, of course, a little later. It will be known. Everything will depend on that. It is possible to make a completely carbon airship. Yes. It will be expensive and cool. The question is about the task. If it is an expensive, cool airship, then that's how it is. If it is inexpensive, disposable, and for a special task, then it is a completely different task. In general, carbon is a sign of some expensive car. Usually it's sports cars. Expensive cars have carbon. What is again peculiar? Yes, because any technological process can be inherently adjusted for mass production. Then the cost of the process tends to minimize, and thus carbon products can become, in nature, unaffordable. Because carbon is one of the most abundant and common forms of chemical elements on the planet. What is so expensive about it in the world? Here's a question. Do you believe, not knowing to whom, in the answer that the USA was on the moon? Well... You can remain silent, you can answer. Or do you have your own theory? As employees of Roscosmos, we are prohibited from discussing this topic. By the way, yes. You see, we have two employees of Roscosmos in the frame. And Dennis mentioned this as well. So let's say all the people in the project are, so to speak, not random individuals, at least. A stratospheric airship is indeed a complex task. Are there enough resources and specialists to implement such a project? It will most certainly be enough. Where will you conduct the testing of systems and materials for this project? For which specific one? Well, indeed, apparently, for a stratospheric airship, you see. Yes, everything has its time. We will test some systems at our own facilities. We will test some systems with contractors who will carry out part of the work there. We will definitely assemble the complex for all this, and we'll test it in our own hangar, of course. Because the construction of a stratospheric airship should already have its own hangar built for it. 
such as a dedicated facility. So, the question is, how do you plan to protect the rights of investors when the government, or in the event that the government decides that such a company cannot be private, voluntarily or involuntarily makes the company state-owned? Voluntarily or involuntarily? Well, first of all, you need to cooperate with the government from the very beginning and somehow not separate yourself from it. In general, be loyal to the government so that the government is loyal to you. But if it suddenly tries to take something away... Listen, it actually seems to me that, on the contrary, I recently saw a news item that the government seems to continue down the path of reducing its role in the economy overall. In general, our country as a whole, although relatively recently, is gradually and steadily moving towards a capitalist economy, which is a significant shift. A capitalist economy implies that private companies actively engage in these types of economic activities in various sectors because they are more competitive. That is, competition itself, capitalism of course, they are more effective, and our states are benefiting from them. With their solutions and considerations, it leads to the realization that if three private companies are competing with each other, they are much more efficient than some state monopoly. And as Pasha rightly said, indeed, the government has already since changed its course towards private companies. They even allowed a private space company. Finally, Aliloya. Although we had several before, now we have this one, SR Space, from Oleg Mansurov. And they said, let's go. They even sent people into space. So I think with airships, especially if we don't have, how should I put it, overly liberal views, then everything will generally be fine. Well, yes, but just in case, of course, we will come up with various investor protection systems. Even the same company, Solar Group, is actually not registered in Russia. As a matter of fact, it is registered in another country. Yes, our project is international, and the entire system is being built internationally. So if something happens in Russia, don't worry. Well, yes, and as many times before, this is actually a frequent question, especially about Sovelmash. What if it's precisely collective investments? There is strength in that. Since there are so many of us, it might not be advantageous for the government to go against such a large number of people. Yes, don't forget that together we are strong. If someone is trying to take something from us, just imagine how many countries, 192, are currently registered in our personal cabinet. Imagine that protests will begin in 190 countries regarding who actually needs this at all. Our security system is built into the very ideology. It's one thing to take a business away from one person, say an oligarch, and another thing to take a business away from 70,000 people. It's a questionable endeavor. Organize people. Because people were able to organize themselves, finance, and build an enterprise. If they take it away from them, I think no one will like it. No one will just sit back and say, well, okay. By the way, regarding the state company, it seems that there is a discussion, or perhaps it has already been decided that in some state-owned companies, the government no longer needs to hold a controlling stake, but rather just a blocking stake, similar to Sberbank. This applies to some large state corporations. The state wants to get rid of the wrongdoing by large companies so that they can be transferred into private hands. We are moving towards capitalism. Therefore, overall, I can't say that the state needs it very much. So what exactly will be the power plant specifically for the stratospheric airship in particular? What is the minimum lift capacity for such devices? The first question, what type of power plant will there be? For the astrospheric airship, perhaps, or maybe, exactly, specifically, or even... Good question. In the future, of course, it will be fuel cells powered by natural gas, plus solar panels. Naturally, this is an energy system. In that environment, the atmosphere is certainly rarefied. It will be more difficult, and fuel will be consumed in a different manner. I don't know, 
perhaps something plasma-related for creating propulsive force. Well, the atmosphere is rarefied enough to install a plasma engine there. Plasma or ion propulsion engines can and should be used in the stratosphere. Where will the energy come from? Sun. Sun, fuel cells, or microturbines like generator installations. On board. And the hydrogen tanks. But I don't remember at what altitude hydrogen starts in the atmosphere. Oh, you can take it right away. From there. Look, Artyom is suggesting that there is no hydrogen there. There is some helium at a certain height. We will also invite Artem to one of the broadcasts so that everyone knows more about Lys. I think people will be interested in getting to know each other. Yes, we are sending everyone away. It's simple, really. The engineers have a bit of a fear of cameras, so someone has to take the heat for them. But they are all getting used to the fact that the cameras are in the office. We sit here, they walk around, they look at us, and it seems like nothing too scary is happening. And little by little, everyone will get used to it. We will place it in the laboratory, as there will be experiments, and it will be interesting to show. Next question coming up right away. Can you tell me what is the maximum lift capacity of such advanced stratospheric vehicles that are designed for high altitude operations? Lifting, that is, the additional useful load. The maximum lifting capacity is noted. Most likely about the payload. Two tons is probably too much to lift into the stratosphere. There, the air is thin. While here, the air is dense. Likely. A device of approximately this approximate size can lift about 40 tons near the ground. However, an aircraft of the same size in the stratosphere can hold only 2 tons due to the difference in atmospheric densities. It could potentially carry more, but its dimensions would become incredibly large, making it difficult to create an aircraft that can take off under such pressure and operate at the pressure found in the stratosphere. This is the main complexity so that it doesn't all expand and come apart. Yes, there will be fueling, transporting, and a lot of other things to do while it takes off, and then when it descends. But overall, it is a manageable task. They are writing the sensor. Don't forget to install. Is there a sensor? Of course. But so that people can actually see how much longer they have to wait until the ascent. So indeed, absolutely great. Next, by the way, everything about this system... I asked you why not compass, and you said that compass doesn't have this. They write, and here several people have mentioned that there is, there is, there is a pilot. There is a system with the compass, just in case they are informing you. I don't know. I love Tiflitz. I've been working with him for how many years? Probably ten. Most likely it's more or less the same. It depends on what someone likes. In fact, there are many control systems. We can invite the guys from over at the compass here, talk to them, and have a discussion, then choose from the two. But the choice, in general, is limited in our country, so yes. If it's not one, then it's the other. They are currently asking whether you still work at Roscosmos or not, at the moment? Not anymore. No one is working, but former employees of Roscosmos are now only at Novi, right? Yes, indeed. Within our team, we still have several active employees who are part of the NOVA project. These dedicated individuals continue to work diligently in the field of space exploration. We will not name them at this current time. They plan to leave from there soon enough. In general, everyone there already knows that they will be dealing with the states and even makes a few jokes about it. Why do you still come to work here? Go focus on your own construction. In reality, there are several such people, and no one there is that sarcastic. I just made up this mood right now. In fact, one person just has a dissertation that needs to be completed, and this enterprise, where he works, is mentioned throughout the dissertation. So it's just for the dissertation. Well, for the others, it's just inertia, finishing up tasks, simply not running away from there, so that everything is done humanely. So... I am actually looking at questions on the Solar Group channel 
and this is how Rostata is used over the city to find parking spaces. That's it. Why is there no description of the project? It's easier to mount cameras on poles, more precisely, not just to mount them, but to use them for finding workers. Parking. It's already available. Yes, there is an application now. They probably used satellites for this. Yandex, yes. How does it do that? No, well, Yandex is just saying there is parking. It shows where it is occupied and where it is not. I don't know. You can check it on Yandex.Navigator. There are free spots and you can pay for them. They have done a great job with it. Maybe they even have Rostat flying. Although they do have helicopters flying under Moscow. Yandex can afford a lot. So... I don't understand what the project writing is about, please write where it is lacking. I looked, the writing is there, everything seems to be in place. When the button to increase the package currently appears, you will be able to increase your package option and we will ask our contact center to call ah. all current investors to inform them that this feature is now available to you because in the future it will not be possible to increase packages taken during the pre-launch in the system. This is the way it is, but there is a chance to get them. Later, it won't be possible to buy them, so if you want to increase the quantity, it has to be done now. Therefore, the main thing is to simply check that everyone's contact number is up to date so that you can be reached. To change the emergency altitude of a stratospheric vehicle, a capsule with liquid nitrogen or helium, and an electromagnetic valve can be used, such as... No. This is an emergency system, meaning it is used once, and the small gas cylinder can be used. Yes, there is a system for changing altitude that involves phase transitions of liquids and various gases, and everything works correctly. Yes, and the system can be adjusted so precisely that altitude can be controlled entirely by solar heating. The sun rose. Heated up, the apparatus changed altitude, the sun set, or the apparatus concealed itself, froze, underwent a phase transition, and the altitude changed. If everything is very precisely aligned and coordinated with the currents, it is possible to not expend any energy at all, and the device will be long-lasting as a result. By the way, here is Alex Torrent, as the person is signed, giving various recommendations. I don't know, maybe it would be worth talking to him later. He writes such things. Take the Balakovo carbon fabric. It has always been cheaper. It's as if the person really understands something. Well, I guess you understand what I'm talking about because I don't know. Carbon, little carbon. It also mentions that it is possible to heat gas by transmitting infrared radiation from a powerful source through optical fibers in the mid-infrared spectrum zonally. By the way, it is indeed possible. It turns out that if, I don't know, you heat the shell to a temperature range of approximately 100 to 200 degrees Celsius, there could simply be some optical cable running through it, possibly transmitting data or signals, and the source on the ground would be some kind of extremely powerful laser beam. Balakovo carbon production. A few dozen kilowatts, that can work, but you'll need, well, like, you'll have optics. But you just need to calculate which one is more effective. No, that's not it. You see, this is Star Wars. You see, Alex wrote several recommendations. And since I find it even difficult to read such questions, I understand that the person has a very deep understanding. I read it there. Yes, so, Alex, if you have any great recommendations, maybe you understand this issue, you can get in touch, including with Dennis or write to support, we will connect with you in the chat, maybe we can communicate. Alex got into a fight with someone in the comments and someone was removed. Yes, perhaps we can definitely create something interesting together. Feel free to reach out. In general, I periodically see people writing about what to discuss on various issues, asking how to collaborate. Remember that you can join the team, or at the very least, you can have a conversation. Yes, <coughs> we are currently experiencing a bit of turbulence in terms of organization. There are already many requests coming in, and I can help you with this or that. I have kind of written everyone down in a list. I remember everyone. If you are watching now, I will definitely write to all of you soon. So yes, any help is welcome.
but it's just not possible to respond to everything at once. All questions are progressive, and everything has its time. I understand that you really want to help. The topic of airships is very cool, and we will most likely be building it as a whole country. Just, yes, indicate that you are engaged in this or that, and want to participate. You can contact through technical support or just write in Telegram, and I will see it. We will be forming a base and, in the end, indeed collaboratively building devices together. Thank you for your activity. A couple more additional questions on the financial topic. Why not create a scale showing how many shares have been purchased for Sovelmash and airships? Perhaps several more details could be included. It can be done. It's just that earlier this topic wasn't very interesting to people. People have asked for chocolate in relation to treatment and funding. Well, if necessary, it can be done. It's just that is there any point in looking at it every day? We publish the data periodically, so I guess it can be done. And how many stages of financing will there be in total, I ask? We have a total of 20 stages of financing. We plan to go through this path in about 3 to 5 years. Right now, we are not at the first stage. We are at the pre-launch zero stage of financing, where you can enter the project on super cool and advantageous terms. So study these terms. All investment proposals are very easily and conveniently available in the personal account on our platform. As you remember, the pre-launch phase will indeed be completed shortly, and the conditions that exist today will never be available in the project. This is definitely not for anyone under any conditions, Maybe even if at some point some conditions are given to someone, but just not pre-launch ones. Right now, this is the most important thing. For the most loyal investors who are joining now, while not everything is clear yet. Well, that's it. The questions are over, and we have actually exceeded the two-hour mark that we had set for ourselves. There were many questions, and there were many viewers. Thank you very much for your activity. Friends, you can step away and say more. Pedia, Dennis. So, definitely keep an eye on the stratosphere, yes. This will be because it's really cool. Don't miss it. Yes. Pavel Igorovich, there are plans in the future to manage all direct lines, especially from the troposphere with airships and others through the solar group application. Oh, so indeed, perhaps every person can actually, possibly, potentially... We will definitely stream only on our own platform, yes, in our own application. It is probably possible. The question is, is it necessary? Instead, we will have our own communication system and our own application. Yes. Close system completely. Yes, we can. What shall we do? We will tell whether the earth is flat or round, but only those who download the application will see it. By the way, we have a task to check. I will verify the flat earth at this given elevation. Task. There is no such task. The earth is spherical. Yes, I'm just joking. I don't believe in this theory either, but anyway. I don't understand if people talk about it for fun or if many really believe in it. Let's not do that. But, by the way, I didn't tell you, we have an idea to hold a webinar on this topic next week. But we will inform you about that later, not me. We have a proposal there. So, for those interested in the topic, stay tuned for updates. Who came to the CBD to talk about Flat Earth? I don't remember. So, well, let's wrap it up like this. Thank you all very much. Just a reminder, likes. Yuri Loza, I remembered. Likes, reposts, please don't forget. Do you want to conduct a webinar, him? No, I'll tell you now. We'll disconnect and decide whether we need to do this or not. A certain proposal has been made, let's say. Likes, reposts, and don't forget that if you send this link to your friend right now, they will be able to watch the recording through the same link. Yes, and tell that there will be a launch into the atmosphere with a live broadcast. We act swiftly and consistently. Exactly. Besides the time, we will publish announcements and you will see all the news in the Telegram chat. If you are not subscribed there, do so. If your friends are not there and you want to tell them, let them join. Everything will be conducted in Telegram and the exact time, date and place will all be there. Yes, the link will be right under the broadcast. The main thing is not to miss it. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, everyone.